I will. So, may I continue? Let's continue. Shalom, Rastafari, Shabbat Shalom, Sendet Salam. This is the seventh uh, Sabbath in our uh, Luni solar cycle of Torah readings and feedings in this portion as we went through some of the etymology right here of the seventh of the Rastafari Sabbath study number seven which in the Hebrew is called Vayitze or Vayitze, but we broke this down based on the Ethiopic. We were able to recover the correct um, pronunciation as well as the meaning. And this also kind of shows the, the harmony between the Biblical Hebrew and the Ethiopic and, and the key and the code in the Ethiopic. So this is some of the etymology, and that's an important aspect as well. But the Torah portions have some interesting subject matter. And I and I honestly must share with the eye of them. Sometimes you don't really get it at first, or you think you already know, okay, this portion, this, okay, this Jacob and Jacob and that such and such. And, and a lot of times we would have the ability to miss a blessing because we just don't want to get into it. In other words, go into it. In other words, and we have to encourage ourselves to deal with it. And this portion is very interesting concerning Black Jacob or Black Jacob, the the darkling Jacob, the Anansi, so to speak, Jacob or Brer Rabbit, you know, like Bra Bra Jacob. And now Jacob and Esau, they have a situation, the the birthright from the last Sabbatical reading and feeding. And now, the portion that we was up to, and I want to share this particular book here, which is an interesting book, because we started to see within the teaching of Jacob and the story of Jacob, when we break down, well, what he went through. He was blessed. And you notice there's this pattern of those who are blessed or have received a, a divine intervention and were shown certain things which are to come to pass, many of them have to go through great trials and tribulation. And this is kind of the consistent um, spiritual and even a metaphysical theme that we will find when we study Torah, when we study the Bible, when we study the scriptures, and then when we study the real lives of people who've had a spiritual or a prophetic call in the God of truth and in the true God. And Yaakov, Jacob, becomes a template of this. And in this particular seventh uh, Torah portion, reading and feeding, where Wetza'a uh, or Vayate, this portion right here, let us go to the beginning of this right here, where it says this portion, it tells of Yaakov's travels to, his life in, and is returned from a place known as Karan or Haran. Now, this particular kufl, it recounts Yaakov's dream of a ladder, of a ladder to heaven, a ladder to reach heaven. This is where we get the mundane or the worldly idea of um, stairway to heaven. And there's a particular song, some of you all probably know of the Stairway to Heaven song, and people play it backwards to hear secret messages. And, but there's a movie, too, that was made, um, Stairway to Heaven. It's an old 50s or 60s movie. But it's kind of interesting, some of the themes, metaphysical, spiritual um, themes that are discussed in some of these um, movies and plays. But then when we understand Torah and Scripture, we start to see the the ancient mythos or the mishtir or, or the mystery. And the same is true with Jacob's dream of a ladder to heaven. Now, it's, it's at this particular portion that we would like to continue what we left off before. And we had left off previously um, trying to recall which particular song of Burhana Selassie, whom the world knows as Bob Marley, but whom the Orthodox faithful and the Ethiopian Hebrew faithful know as Berhana Selassie, or the light of the Trinity, the light of the God of Abraham, Yisahak, and Yaakov. And we're discussing Jacob in this particular Torah portion here. 
and Jacob had ran from his brother, had ran from his brother Esau, because Esau or Esau wanted to kill, in other words, red, hairy Esau. He wanted to kill smooth, black Yaakov. He wanted to kill Jacob because he had sold his birthright to Jacob, but then Jacob also had got the blessing, so forth and so on. Now, in the last portion, we, we, we spoke about how um, some had speculated that when Jacob left and he traveled to Haran, that he had went without a single ring or bracelet. He didn't have any, any valuables. So he wasn't just poor, but he was poor. He, he, he didn't have anything. He, he's on the run. And so isn't this interesting? It's like Abraham, Abraham and Sarah from previous Torah portions where Abraham is told that you're going to be a father of a, of, of a multitude and all nations are going to be blessed. And he's here almost, almost 100 years old. You know what I'm saying? And his wife, very much close to the same age as him. So they're, both of them are almost, you know, they are senior so-called, quote, citizens. But they don't have any child. They don't have any child. And the Almighty said, you're going to be the father of many nations, and he doesn't even have a seed. Now, if this was you or me or I or I, I and I, and we didn't have this template before us, we would think that way. Was it really God? Was it really the true God who said these things? Because if he said these things, well, where is the manifestation of it? But there's some very important biblical principles that we must keep in mind. It says that we walk by imnets, we walk by faith and not by sight. And here's what's interesting, that we, those of us who know the story, we find that Abraham did have seed and Sarah did conceive even in her old age. And from that patriarch or ancestor, Yisahak, whose name means, ironically and interestingly enough, his name means he laughed, as in Yisakal, which is Ethiopic or Amharic, Yisakal or Yisahak, Yisahak, Sak, 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 Kiki, 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 you know, means to laugh. So now we have the the grandson or from abraham the um the the, the grandson and the great grandson now we have jacob jacob running from esau right now the portion where it speaks about um how jacob slept on 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 rocks you, you remember that part J jacob slept on the portion of the scripture where Jacob makes cold ground his bed. Now, Bob Marley, Burhana Selassie, has a song. Okay, this is the portion around Jacob and the ladder. Let's go through this right here for a moment to, to, to connect this with. Okay, so we have when Yaakov left Beersheba for Haran, he stopped at a place for the night. He stopped at a place for the night. So as he's fleeing from his brother, from Esau, he stops at a certain, a certain place for the night, and he used a stone. He used a stone for a pillow. How many of you all have slept on a stone? I'm sure some have. You understand? But think about it. You understand? Let, let's, let's see this in its reality. Let's even put ourselves, in other words, put ourselves in character in order to really fully and truly in order to fully and truly understand this particular matter. So it's at this particular point in Genesis 28 verses 10 to 11. Now he had dreamed that he saw a ladder or a stairway to heaven on which God's angels, Ha Elohim's angels, Ascended and descended, Genesis 28 and 12. And Ha Elohim stood beside him and promised to give him and his numerous descendants the land on which he lay. Now, you have to remember at this time, uh, Jacob, Yaakov, did not even have a wife. 
but it was already told to him that he's going to have numerous descendants. This, is, this teaches us what faith, what the true faith and the true God requires. Some may say that God has a sense of humor because some of this seems almost ironic and humorous, but however humorous it might seem, Ha Elohim is true. So it was said that through his descendants, all the earth would be blessed. But see, he's feeling, must be, at the same time, he's feeling somewhat cursed because he's running from his brother. His brother want to kill him. He don't have nothing, basically. He's very, he's very destitute. But still, he has promised this, and he's promised to stay with him wherever he went and bring him back to the land. So the Almighty, in the, in the midst of his, of his trouble, is promising to be with him, not to forsake him and to bring him back to the land, Genesis twenty-eight thirteen to 15. Now, Yaakov, no doubt, Jacob, no doubt, woke up afraid. And Jacob wrote, woke up, you know, what is it, you know, what is all of this, what is all of this about? He remarked that surely the place, but what he was convinced of, is that the place was the house of El, was the house of Hail, it was the house of God, the gate the gateway or even the star gate to heaven and of heaven. And so he called the place Betel, Beta El, Bethel, or the house, the bait of El. Although the Canaanites, the, the people who had illegally occupied this particular land, and we learn this from the book of Hanok and Enoch and even Eolda, the Yule and Jubilees, that the people who had occupied this land called the Canaanites, they called the city Luz. They called the city Luz. Remember, make a note of these names to study the meaning of these names and the metaphysical connection of these names to the central ideas of the story and even to illuminate on the, on the other aspects of the story that most who don't check out the names miss out, miss out on. So the names are very important keys to the understanding of the story. They're like, they're like um, stargates, so to speak. You have to dial in to the meaning of these names and then put it into the context to really get an understanding. Now, Genesis 28, 16 to 19, Jacob took the stone from under his head. Now, the stone that he slapped on and had this particular vision, he took it from under his head and he set it up as a pillar. He set this up as a pillar. Some interpret the pillar in its Ethiopic and Eastern sense to be an obelisk, to be a, what we call in Ethiopia a howlet, a howlet or an obelisk. But this must be a, a small representation of it. And he poured oil on it, according to Genesis 28 and 18. And Yaakov, he vowed. Now he makes a vow. Now, now he is putting, he is giving his word now, which is a step towards, towards solidifying that covenant. And in covenant, he vowed that if Elohim would stay with him and would give him bread and clothing and return him to his father's house in peace, be shalom or be salam, then God would be his God. Then the God that he is having converse and communication would be his God. And the, the, the stone pillar would be God's house in, in, in symbolism. Now, let's, let's understand this keyly because it's a half of the story that is missed out because most people gloss over it. You understand? And he would give God a tenth. In addition to that, he says that he would give God an asarat, what's known as an asarat, or the tenth portion. You understand? As we count on who let sourced, arat, amisidis, sebat, cement, zetang, asar. He would give an asarat, a tenth, a tithe of whatever he received. So whatever the Almighty blessed him with, a tenth of that would be for 
the God who he is having converse with and communicating with and the one who's saying that he would be blessed and that God would be with him and would bring him once again to this land and to his father's house. Genesis 28, 20 to 22. Now, let us understand this stone pillar in Rastafari Revelation. Let's look at Bob Marley's, unfortunately, if we play the tune, they, they might block the video in certain places, and we talked on this before, that they've been blocking certain videos with Bob Marley tunes. And some of y'all, if y'all have been posting music or posting videos and you put a little bit of Bob Marley music there, you would notice that they say that certain countries, namely Germany, Germany, you know, um, and other places like that won't, won't um you know, won't play it, and they wonder why the economy is bad because they're trying to steal from Rastafari. But be that as it may, in the album Natty Dread, when we go to the album Natty Dread, now this is an interesting book. Um, this is actually, a book is in Japanese and um, English. It's called Vibes, this particular book in Japanese and, um, and English, and give you a sample right here where there's Talking Blues, some of the albums of, of uh, Burhana Selassie, a selection of the albums of Burhana Selassie have been translated in Japanese over here, and then we have the English over there. The question I ask is when we're going to get some good translation of this in the Royal Amharic, so we have, you know, we have work to do. So all you Ethiopian Hebrews and Ethiopian Rastafari, you know, we have our work cut out. But it's this particular song that we're just going to go through the lyrics of this. And you'll probably know this song, hopefully, and can check it out if you don't know it. In Talking Blues, it says, yeah, oh, yeah, cold ground was my bed last night. So what Burhana Selassie or Bob Marley is doing, he's giving, he's giving voice to this particular Torah portion. This particular seventh Torah portion, Bob Marley is giving in Rastafari revelation, he's given voice to this experience of Jacob, of Jacob and the, and the ladder and Jacob sleeping on the stone and that particular experience when he says in his lyrics here that cold ground was my bed last night and rock was my pillow too. And rock was my pillow too. Now compare that with this Torah portion, reading and feeding, Genesis chapter 28, and you'll see where that inspiration, mystically, biblically, and prophetically, in Burhana Selassie, in Bob Marley's Nancy Dread, Talking Blues tune, came from. And we go further. It says, cold ground was my bed last night, and rock was my pillow too. I'm saying talking blues. Now, think about this for a moment. Bamarinya in the Amharic. When we say when we say blue, you know how to say blue in in Amharic? Blue in Amharic is se ma ya we or se ma ya we. Samayawi and samai is heaven. Samai is heaven. So when we say the color, when we say the color blue, this equals blue, the color, the color blue or related to the sky. So notice the mystic, the mystic in Burhana Selassie's song, in this particular song, Talking Blues. He's saying Talking Blues. So who, who is Ya'iko communicating with? There was a stairway to heaven, a communication to heaven. So he was speaking with the blues. He was talking blues, and he was communicating with the blues, with the heavens, and with the true God, the God of his God, the God of Israel. It goes on to say, Bob Marley's talking blues, or talking heavenly, they say your feet is just too big for your shoes. Your feet, remember what Yaakov, Yaakov asked for bread? He asks for clothing. Here Marley says, they say your feet is just too big for your shoes. Talking blues, talking blues, your feet is just too big for your shoes. Then it goes on. It says, 
I've been down on the rock for so long. This particular tune here, Talking Blues of Burhana Selassie of Bob Marley, it fits perfectly with this seventh Torah portion, Reading and Feeding, known in the, in the Hebrew as Yitse or Vayitse, in the Ge'ez as Wewetza'a, and in the Royal Amharic of the King of Kings as Wetzito, meaning that he went, he came out. He had to leave, he had to flee from his murderous, his murderous brother, speaking of Esau. So black Jacob had to flee from his murderous brother. And here Burhan Salasi says, I've been down on the rock for so long, I seem to wear a permanent screw. In other words, a screw face. You understand? Because experiences, as we know, can make one very bitter, can even make the outer the outer appearance bitter. So he wore a screw because he'd been on the rock for so long. I've been down on the rock for so long. I seem to wear a permanent screw, but I'm going to steer in the sun. But I'm going to, so the next day when Yaakov wakes up now, he stands up this pillar. Now, we all understand that, that what a pillar is. You understand? The, the pillar is a, is a stella, a, a obelisk, even in the mini relief of the, of the stone. However big that stone was, he stood that stone up, he poured oil on it. But notice what Marley says. He says, but I'm going to steer in the sun, let the rays shine in my eyes. Because this, this, this stairway to heaven, this communication, his spiritual eyes, are being illuminated. You understand? This is a great vision. You understand? That Jacob, that our ancestor Jacob has had. And this is a great song that Burhan Selassie, Bob Marley, has composed, Bob Marley and the Whalers. It says, I'm going to just, I'm going to take a just a one step. I'm going to take a just a one step more. He's going to keep moving. He's keep moving, and Jacob, Black Jacob, is making a journey. Black Jacob is the original talking blues, but Bob Marley is giving powerful voice to it. Now, notice what comes next. Cause I feel like bombing a church. Yeah, I feel like, but now, Jacob, he's establishing the true church. You understand? The Beta El, or Bethel. <laughs> In the land of the Canaanites, which was the old, the fall. So, so we have a change of the spiritual guard, so to speak. Now that you know that the preacher is lying. That the preacher is lying. So who's going to stay at home when the freedom fighters are fighting? So what Jacob is going through, this is a spiritual, a spiritual warfare that he's going through, you understand, in this particular, in this particular um, portion of the Torah. Marley goes on, talking blues, talking blues. They say, you know, with the chorus, the refrain, they say your feet is just too big for your shoes, talking blues, keep on talking blues. They say, you hear what they say? Didn't you hear? Then it comes back to, to, to the penultimate, to, to the root part even of this Torah portion, reading and feeding concerning black Jacob and the ladder and the stairway to heaven and the talking blues. Cold ground was my bed last night. Rock stone, he says at this point in the beginning, was rock was my pillow too. Here he says rock stone was my pillow too. Cold ground was my bed last night and rock was my pillow too. Talking blues, talking blues. I seen it appears that I wear a permanent screw. Now, this is connected with this portion right here. And now, uh, what we want to do is continue with the interlinear, the rabbinic interlinear um, interpretation and show that the fullness. You understand, of this, even from a so-called Jewish or Judaic or Judeo-Christian way, is Rastafari. But the preacher doesn't preach Rastafari. 
You understand? The churches, the majority of them that, that, that preach, do not preach Rastafari. They don't say, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. But in truth, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. So, so it is. But as we go on right here, Hezekiah, one named Hezekiah, had taught that Yaakov, Jacob. Now I want you to really get this talking blue, just to understand the, the, the seeming deprivation, the, the, the poverty, the, the, the loneliness, you understand, the, the fearfulness even, the, the, even on a certain level, the uncertainty. Because even after this vision, things did not immediately get better. He had to hold that, that faith, that, 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 that substance, you understand, faith is the substance of things what? You see what I'm saying? He had to hold that even though it wasn't so-called apparent. If he were to tell other people, they say, you crazy, man. Ain't... That wasn't God talking to you. You see what I'm saying? So he had to hold that faith firm. Now, Hezekiah had taught that Yaakov was 63 years old when Yisahak had blessed him. Now, we always get this idea that Jacob was like a young guy, like Jacob was like 16 years old, 13 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. No, no, no. Here, according to this, and this is what we found very interesting, we wanted to touch on it, that Hezekiah had taught that Yaakov was 63 years old when Yisahak had blessed him. Now, as a Baraita or outside of it, outside of the traditional Talmudic taught in the Babylonian Talmud, Megillah 17a, and that Yaakov, he had spent another 14, check this out, 14 years secluded in the land of Israel, studying under Eber or Heber, studying the, the Hebrew way, and a further seven years working for the matriarchs. The matriarchs, the ma you know, the matriarchs or the matriarchs in this story is Rachel and Leah or Leah and Rachel. So he, w he spent another seven years working for the matriarchs in order to marry the woman that he, he chose to marry. First, we know Laban had married the older one before the younger one, Leah. So when he woke up the next day, he thinks that, oh, this is uh, Rachel. And then he looks, oh, it's Leah. And he said, why did you do this? And then he worked enough. So we know the story, and the story is right here. But check this out. He married at the age of 84. Think about that. Now, a lot of people would say, no, it can't be. He couldn't have got married when he was 84 years old. That couldn't be so. Well, his, his brother Esau, Esau was married at the age of 40. Esau was at, married at the age of 40, Genesis 26 and 34. Thus, see, here's the key of what we learned. What, what does this teach us? First of all, it teaches us that the pastor or the preacher was lying. You understand? And that's, that many of these so-called churches, they, they deserve that, but, therefore, but for the grace of God, there go I, as it is said. Thus, we learn that God, Ha Elohim, he hastens the happiness of the wicked. Now, most people say, no, that can't be true. Why would God hasten, in other words, help the wicked to be happy real quick, real fast? He hastens the happiness of the wicked, but here's the key, that he delays that of the tzaddikah. He seems to hasten the happiness of the wicked. When we look at Esau, Esau, at 40 years of age, he was married, but now Jacob now, in this running, in this running away, it's almost like the other song, keep running and running and running and running, but you can't run away from yourself. You understand? But in his running away, in his fleeing from his murderous brother, and in going through the 14 years being secluded and studying under Eber, and another seven years working for the matriarchs, that he was married finally at the age of 84, while his brother was married at the age of 40. So many of the teachers going over this data and information and studying the Torah deeply, they ask themselves, I mean, well, what sense does this make? And the overstanding is that Ha Elohim or Ha Shem Baruch Hu, that Jah, in other words, hastens the happiness of the wicked. 
So just because someone seems to be quickly, you know, like quickly, um, uh, quickly happy, <laughs> you know, and, you know, now they say happy and gay, gay is happy, so forth and so on. Just a little footnote there. But the, um, um, but that true happiness or blessedness of the righteous appears or seems to be delayed. And in a sense of, quote, time, it does seem to be delayed. Now, there was Rabbi Hoshaya. Rabbi Hoshaya had noted that Genesis 28 and 7 already stated, quote, and Yaakov hearkened to his father and his mother and was gone to Pandan Aram. He went to Pandan Aram, end quote. And thus, Rabbi or Rabbi or Hoshaya asks why, Genesis 28 and 10 says, quote, and Yaakov went out from Beersheba. Now, Rabbi or Hoshaya taught that Yaakov reasoned. He reasoned. Come, let us reason. He reasoned that, when his father desired to immigrate from the land of Israel, he first sought permission at the place known as Beersheba. So Yaakov, he also now, he went to Beersheba, to the well of Sheba, to seek God's permission, to seek God's permission. And this is in the Genesis um, Reba or Rabba 68 and 5. Now, uh, Rabbi Judan and Rav Huna, they commented on why Genesis 28 and 10 says this. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 28 and 10. Quote, when Jacob went out from Beersheba, end quote. When Jacob went out, this is, this is the, the beginning of this Torah portion. When Jacob went out from Beersheba, well, what does this mean? Well, Rabbi Judan or Yudan taught that it means that Yaakov sought to leave, quote, out of the well of the oath. You see, now we have to get into the meaning of Beersheba. Beersheba is not a common Gentile Anglo word. It's an ancient Ethiopic Hebraic word. So what does this mean? He left from this place, this place, this name has a significance. That's why the translators couldn't easily translate it, so they kept it as it is, as an ancient name or nomenclature. But now some of the earlier Jews and Hebrews, they went through some of the mathematics on the meaning of the name, the meaning of the Shem. The meaning of this Shem, Bereshiva, is bir or bir 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 means well in one of the Hebraic dialects. And Rabbi Judah, he connected the Sheba, you understand, or the Shaba'a, the Shaba'a, the Shaba'a with the Shavua, with the Shavua, or the Shavua, which means an oath, which means an oath. So a translation of it would be either the well of the sevens, and notice this is the seventh sabbatical Torah portion reading and seating. This is the seventh, as well as that seven, Sheba, Sheba, also means an oath. In other words, when one makes an oath, which is on a level a type of a vow, a type of a covenant of sorts, an oath, which means oath as in the oath that Genesis 21, 31 reports that Abraham and Abimelech, they swore to each other. They came into a covenant. They came into an agreement or what legally is called, they came into a meeting of the minds. They came into a meeting of the minds. So Rebbe Judah taught that Yaakov reasoned that he did not want Abimelech to demand that Yaakov swear to Abimelech a commitment of non-aggression. You see, this swearing, basically, or this covenant was an agreement of non-aggression. In other words, that we are going to dwell at peace with one another and not aggress. In other words, in a sense, they even made a treaty, you understand, which shows how important 
even with non Beta Israel, even with those who are not our people, it's important for us to use the contract, the covenant, and the oath to create a situation that helps the prophecy for us and the blessing fulfilled. In other words, to be peacemakers. So just a note to the eye of them. As Yaakov's grandfather Abraham swore to him, so and so the delay so delayed Jacob's descendants from entering the land of Israel for seven generations. For seven generations. So understand that connection right there. So as a result of Abraham's oath to Abimelech, seven generations. Now when we look at this 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 um, commitment of non aggression, notice what happened. From Abraham, we have to count seven generations. So when we count seven generations from Abraham, we get to Yeshua or Old Testament Joshua. You understand? That had to pass before the Beta Israel in mass and and in force could enter into the uh, the Aretz, the Eretz uh, Yisrael, or the, to the land of Israel, thus to avoid another seven generations of delay. You see, if Jacob now went and made a and, and made a non-aggression treatment at that Bir Sheba, there would be, since there's the well of the sevens, and now we learn the sevens relate to the generations, those seven generations, that for seven generations, we're under a commitment or a treaty of non-aggression. So that means that the Beit Israel would have been delayed for another seven years. Now, thus to avoid this, this additional seven generations of delay, Yaakov, he went, quote, out of the well of the oath. So some had interpreted that actually him leaving this particular well of the oath you understand, was to also preserve him from staying there and then making another agreement as his, as his grandfather had did, which would have been another, a compounded seven, you understand, a compounded seven, to evade a further commitment of non-aggression. Now, Rav Huna taught that the words of Genesis 28 and 10, you see these, these, these opening words of this Torah portion reading and feeding to those who have the spiritual insight was so crucial that many had to really study the, the, the context of it because they understood that there was an importance even in these few words, even in this one line. There's that much importance because this is the code, this is the equation, not just on earth but also in the heaven. So let us understand. Now, Rav Huna examining the words of Genesis 28 and 10, he said that, well, what is meant of out of the well of the birthright? One can also look at the Sheva, the, the, the Sheba, or the Shaba'a, Sheba, as relating to the birthright, the birthright. The birthright, Rob Huna taught that J Jacob reasoned that he did not wish to allow Esau, his, 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 um, you could say his, his evil brother, he did not wish to allow Esau to rise up against him and assert that Jacob had cheated him by taking his birthright and thus lose the advantage of Esau's oath. Remember, Esau, when he sold his birthright, he also made an oath. So it was not as though he did this unconsciously. You understand? He despised his birthright. So when Esau conveyed his birthright in Genesis 25 and 33, you'll see more information on that. But a further Rebbe, a further uh, rabbinical teacher and scholar, um, Berechiah, had taught that the words of Genesis 28 and 10 mean, quote, out of the well of blessing. So now here we have the Shabbat, Sheba. You understand the connection with Sheba and even Queen of Sheba and by extension Ethiopia. We have it we, we have it as an oath. Some translate as as the well of an oath. But furthermore, we find this translated as this oath referring to a non aggression treaty or pact. Then further we have it as birthright. 
now with Rabbi uh, Berakiah, he sees the Shaba or the Sheba as referring to blessing, as referring to out of the well of blessing, teaching that Jacob reasoned that he did not want Esau to rise up against him and assert that Jacob had cheated, that, that, that Jacob had cheated, right, by taking Esau's blessing, by taking of Esau's blessing, and so frustrate his mother, Rebecca's labors on his behalf. So even we have the element of the matriarchy or the role of the mothers and the woman, in other words, black woman. You understand? You have a very, you understand, important role, and this is Old Testament we're talking about. You understand? This is Old Testament here. Now, our rabbis or our ancient teachers taught that Jacob reached Haran on the same day as Genesis 28 and 10 reports that he went toward Karan or Haran. Rabbi Berakiah said in Rabbi Yishak's name, however, that Genesis 28 and 10 merely or only speaks as people do in a colloquial sense or colloquially when they say, so-and-so has gone to Kazaria or Caesarea, when in fact so-and-so was not actually or had not actually arrived in Caesarea. And therefore he interpreted that in a similar sense here in Genesis 28 and 10 does not mean that Yaakov had actually reached Haran or Karan on the same day that he had set out, that he had set out. But what is interesting, and there's a further, a, a further comment here that we just share with you and just conclude this part, that once in the meat market of, of Emmaus, uh, Rabbi Akiba had asked Reban Gamaliel, and you remember the name Gamaliel is a familiar name, should be to you all who have been studying Scripture, especially New Testament. There was a Rabbi Gamaliel at the time of Hawari Apollos. So most of these teachings, Old Testament teachings, were already circulated even in the time of Yeshua. You understand? So this is, this, these are important elements even in Christina and even in Christianity that are not properly understood. Therefore, the misinterpretation, blonde hair, blue eye, whitewash, and a lot of other nonsense creeps in Santa Claus and Easter egg and Christmas tree because they're not going to the true root. As Christ even said, so you, you do err. You understand? Not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And he also says that y'all worship that which y'all know not. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And Rastafari says, Awo, salvation is of Moa, Anbesa, Zeima, Negeda, Yehuda, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. So here we have this conversation between these Rebbe's, these these Judaic teachers, and Rebbe uh, Yeshua or Joshua, you understand? Um, there was this conversation about the words of Genesis 32 and 32, which we find a little bit interesting right here, where it says, and the sun rose on him, end quote, inquiring whether the sun rose only on him and not on everyone, you know, these kind of reasonings. Does this mean the sun rose only on him and not on anyone else? Now, Rabbi Yishak said that, that it meant that the sun, which had set early for his sake, now rose early for him. Now, Rabbi Yishak noted that Genesis 28 and 10 reports that Jacob, Yaakov, left Beersheba in the south of the land of Israel and went towards Karan, north of the land. And Genesis 28, 11 reports that, quote, he lighted upon the place identified in Genesis 28, 10 to 22 as Beta El or Bethel in the center of the land. Now, Rabbi Yishak explained that when he reached Karan, he asked himself how he could have passed through the place where his fathers had prayed and not have prayed there too. How could he pass to the place where his ancestors had prayed and he didn't 
pray there too. So Rabbi Yitzhak, he deduced, he thought about this. Oh, that's good, okay. Well, he deduced that, uh, that he immediately resolved to turn back, to make a cipher, to, to circle, to circle around, right? And as soon as he did, the earth, some say, contracted, and he immediately lighted or reached upon the place, end quote. After he prayed, he sought to return to Karan, but Ha Elohim Baruchu chose to give this righteous man a night's rest. And immediately, quote, the sun was set. And after this particular time, here's where we have the beginning of the talking blues, where he rests upon that rock, and that rock was his pillow too. And now he gets a vision. You understand? A vision of a ladder, of a stairway to heaven, talking blues. He started to speak Samayawi. There's some more to come on this matter, my brothers and sisters. But just for now, shalom, more to come. Stay tuned.